hello guys. Hope everyone is doing fine. Wait for more participants to join us. My name is Don Fox and I'll be the host for the event. Uh, so uh, yeah, so sorry about that. So uh, sorry, my name is Don. I'll be the host for the event. Today's topic is Excel to Pandas and Back. I'm one of the instructors for the Pragmatic Institute where we provide trainings for both data science and product development. Today, we have Michael Cullen, one of our data science instructors. Uh, Michael holds a master's in statistics from Arizona State University. And he has over three years of experience with research and building software for statistics and artificial intelligence. At Pragmatic, both Michael and I teach hands-on courses and topics ranging from Python basics to deep learning. Today, Michael will demonstrate how Pandas, a popular Python package, can improve existing workflows in Excel. At the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers, so please post your questions in the Zoom chat. In fact, I'm going to say hello in the chat so you can see it pop up. We'll take a look at those questions, and we'll pick some that we will answer towards the end. Uh, with that said, I will hand over things to Michael to kick it off. All right, thank you so much, Don, and welcome everybody to From Excel to Pandas and Back. Um, today, as Don mentioned, we'll be talking about Pandas, this really popular Python library for data analysis, um, in particular labeled data, you know, tables, tabular data, very much something we might think of the, you know, Python's answer to Excel or to MATLAB or to R. I'm going to get things started. Um, uh, so for those of you who are not, maybe not super familiar, um, Jupyter Notebooks are, this is a very common tool, um, especially in data science, especially in interactive programming in Python and other languages. Um, we're having interactive code and text and images and all sorts of things. Um, Binder is what we'll be using to Essentially, I've deployed a GitHub repository with the content for today's lecture, and this will launch a little container in your browser um, that actually gives you an interactive notebook to follow along. So that being said, um, and I mentioned this now because you'll need to start running some of these cells um, in the notebook ahead of time, since some of them take a while to run. Uh, navigate to mybinder.org, um, and I apologize, I know that it's not possible to copy and paste things in Zoom chat, um, but it will be easier to have these here for um, your reference. Once you're at mybinder.org, in this top box where you enter the GitHub repository name or URL, pasting this in the chat here as well. Um, oh wow, you actually can, you can open links from Zoom chat. I thought I did not know you could do that. Okay, well scratch that in that case. Um, is find your notebook and actually just follow this link. And that should, you click on this, you'll see this screen and it'll be starting up that container for you. And this should move decently quickly once um, a few of us start doing it because Binder will, will save the config for this image, but um, this will get you started in getting that notebook going. Um, so again, if you want to follow along, I pasted a link in the chat, um, which will open up this page. Um, it'll start the notebook and once that's running, I'll show you what this looks like on my local machine. You will basically see this file browser. Um, you won't have this overview notebook. This is just mine, but you'll see this Excel to pandas file and you'll see a few other things as well. So go ahead and click on Excel to pandas. This will open up a tab for you. It's going to render that Jupyter notebook. And you should see something like this. Now I'm going to clear the outputs here so it just looks clean, but you'll start seeing these cells. You'll see some code, you'll see some text. And so again, for those of you who haven't used these before, this is a Jupyter notebook. This is again, you know, what our lectures coming from today. Um, so all of these cells that have this kind of monospace font, uh, these are interactive Python code cells. We can run these either by clicking 
this run button at the top, or anytime we're in a cell holding shift and pressing enter, which is what I will typically be doing. And QGrid is not running, so I'll just do this from the binder image in that case. Um, so you'll be running these cells um, basically as we go along to make sure that all the re relevant computations are you know, happening to follow along with examples. Um, while my binder notebook finally gets opened up, switch over to a quick overview. So again, today's Excel to Pandas. Um, we're really gonna be looking at Pandas in the context of how does this improve our existing workflows you know, with Microsoft Excel? How can we uncover more information that maybe we couldn't get from Excel natively? How can we automate tasks, um, whether it's by performing the, you know, the same manipulations to a bunch of different files, whether it's combining a whole bunch of files together and doing some um, you know, more aggregated analysis instead of copying and pasting to get there. Um, we're going to be looking at these workflows in particular, and then how pandas can write things back into Excel. Again, I'm Michael Cullen, data scientist in residence, data science instructor with the Pragmatic Institute, and a little bit about pandas itself. Pandas documentation gives this fairly long explanation. Say it's designed to work with relational labeled data, Best to think of this as tables. Um, they're aiming to be the most powerful and flexible open source analysis tool in any language. They're doing a pretty good job of that so far. We're going to see what that really looks like. But you know, the TLDR here, basic idea is the fast and easy way to analyze data, manipulate data, basically in tables using Python. So why do we use pandas? You know, why not stick with Excel? Why not use just pure Python? What are the benefits here? Um, again, you know, compared to Excel, we can automate tasks. If we have, let's say, a whole bunch of weekly reports or monthly reports, and we have to do the same manipulations, same analysis on all of those spreadsheets, it's the same thing every time. It's a lot of clicking and dragging, programming macros, formatting cells, all these kinds of things. Um, with pandas, we can generally write a single Python script that just does that automatically. We can even, in some cases, did I? We can even, in some cases, um, use pandas to pull data directly from other places. So, for instance, here I'm grabbing a, some tables from this Wikipedia page for world population growth, and I can just read directly from that. XML isn't working either. We'll have to run that example from the binder as well. Um, we actually pull tables directly from the web, even from any HTML we can find. Um, a little bit orthogonal to what I was going to show, though. Um, we can extract information that wasn't there before. In particular, if we have a lot of you know text and strings in a spreadsheet, and we know that that text you know has something meaningful for us, um, there are tools to extract you know tokens and words and manipulate text in Excel, um, but Pandas opens up a lot more powerful options for that. We'll see some of that today. Um, Pandas also plugs in very easily to things like scikit-learn, which is kind of the most popular, you know, canonical library for doing machine learning in Python. Um, and so you can start unifying these workflows as well. You can have your descriptive analysis and reporting happening with Pandas. Uh, from there, you can go right into, after that exploratory analysis, into modeling, into you know, generating predictions, making something you can deploy, um, and also taking those predictions back into Pandas and doing you know, additional analysis on you know, the performance of your machine learning codes. So it really starts to build this you know, nicely integrated workflow. So for today's demo, um, I'm going to be introducing a broad range of capabilities in Pandas. Obviously, we have a pretty short time limit today, so I won't be able to cover exactly how we do everything, but it should get you an idea of you know, what pandas can do and how we can think about using these kinds of tools. And again, we're going to be taking this, really applying it to Excel and showing how we can really streamline a workflow that way. I would be remiss not to tell you guys a little bit about some of our courses though, before we get into the fun stuff. 
Um, so Don mentioned that he and I both teach a number of courses with Pragmatic Institute um, in you know, hands-on data science. I'm just gonna give a couple of the main public offerings we have right now. So today's topics um, you know, in Pandas and sort of you know, applying these Python fundamentals to you know, analyzing, you know, doing descriptive analysis. Um, this is really what we do in our essential data tools course. Um, this starts from really the fundamental building blocks of Python, how to start writing code, how to think about writing code, um, into some more complex topics in programming, doing object-oriented programming, um, and then into more mathematical and database topics, using NumPy for math, using pandas for descriptive analysis, and then taking all of that and automating real business tasks. So today's a little bit of a demo of some of the things we do in Essential Data Tools, um, in which we would be covering this information and more with, of course, a lot more time. Uh, from there, we also get into machine learning and our next course in the pipeline, which is Practical Machine Learning, um, where we teach you know, the, how to think about machine learning, how it works, and actually how to build models in Python and apply them towards real world problems. And for those of you who have maybe a little bit less experience with Python, we also offer an intro to Python course. This is a single three hour live session, um, really starting from scratch. You know, you can start looking at this is what, you know, Python code is. This is how you can start writing it and how you can think about it. Um, and you'll have some exposure to Python libraries like Pandas, like Scikit-learn, um, but not as, perhaps not as applied and in depth as you would in the other courses, but to see you know, what it can do and again, how we think about these tools. Um, and we even close this out with, by building a you know, working machine learning example using um, you know, natural language processing to classify things based on text. So that's just a, a rundown of you know, what we're doing today and also how that maps into the courses we offer. Um, without further ado though, we can actually get to the lecture for today. So back in my binder tab, um, if you ran this cell, you would find that, um, or if you ran that page, you'd find that we're able to open up this notebook. And I'm gonna start running some of these cells um, just ahead of time so that we can talk a little bit about the, the problem we'll be working on. Um, some of these take a little while to run. So again, shift enter will run these cells, all these code cells. If you're following along, I would recommend to start hitting enter at least through this convert to monthly cell. Um, so just hit shift enter a couple times so you get down here. These are gonna take a little while to run so we can start talking about the problem statement. So we're gonna be doing this with a real world data set today. Um, open up this tab as well. Uh, this comes from the UCI Machine Learning Repository, the University of California, Irvine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and this is a wonderful resource for open source, you know, open, not open source, but, you know, open data sets that you can use for, um, you know, building machine learning projects, uh, testing out different tools and techniques, doing exploratory analysis, you know, making reports kind of as you're, you know, developing your skills in data science. In particular, we're using this online retail data set. And this looks at transactions between, um, and the dates actually in the data they give us are a little bit different, but late 2010 through 2011 for this UK based, um, you know, online retailer, which mostly deals to wholesalers. So we get a little bit more info on the data set here. Um, we have eight different columns, and this is also just, you know, it's helpful to maybe get introduction to this, you know, resource of data sets as well. Um, again, you know, so we're looking at a company that mostly sells, um, you know, gifts and we're largely selling to wholesalers. So that's gonna inform, you know, how we think about this data as we start analyzing it. We're given some different attributes. We'll see these in action, um, but this table looks like a whole bunch of rows and columns where we have an invoice number. So a particular purchase that was made, a stock code, which is, you know, like a SKU, like an item code, you know, sort of a identifier for whatever product was being sold. We have a description for that product. Uh, this is going to be text. This is going to be something we're going to work from and try to get some more data out of this text. We have the number of that particular product sold in that transaction. 
we have when this invoice date occurred. We have the price per product. We have a customer ID, and then we have the country that that transaction came from as well. And again, this is coming from, you know, coming to us in all in one big file. Um, I also will say that this data folder link right here um, is in fact a broken link because they had made a typo and I believe they added this ML or perhaps not the ML, perhaps it was the, I think this entire thing. Um, they had a few extra endpoints in the URL, not that one, um, but I have the proper link here in the binder notebook. Um, this is all it would link to, really just a page that has the Excel file that we're working with. Um, and don't really need to worry about that right now because in this cell, we're actually downloading that file programmatically um, into the you know, container we're running this notebook in. And so because this is coming in in one big chunk, right, this, you know, all of these different months and what we're really looking to do in this example, you know, in today's demo is to, um, you know, show how we can automate the same task across a number of files. Um, I just wrote a little bit of code that's going to turn that big file into a bunch of monthly Excel spreadsheets. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about this because this is really just the sort of, you know, step zero for us doing our analysis. Um, but essentially, you know, I bring in this spreadsheet, which now has downloaded into this data directory, into this online retail spreadsheet file. Um, so I just load that in and I essentially just, you know, divide up this data by the month and year and create a table for each of those and then write those to a new Excel spreadsheet. So in fact, just in this block of code, just in preparing us to run today's demo, um, I was actually already using a lot of the contents that we'll be covering. Sort of reverse engineering the monthly reports that we're actually going to aggregate back together at the end of the day. So with that being said, let's start doing some analysis. We're going to load in just one of these months to start with. And so the first one we have in the data that they gave us is December 2010. So we'll load that data frame in. Now the way this works is, um, you know, we have our data frame is PD, which is what we've aliased pandas as pd.readexcel. There we give the path to the spreadsheet. So that's, you know, from where we are right now, it's in data directory and then the monthly directory. And then this is the name of our file that we've generated. And we're going to say, okay, there's no index column there. Um, so, you know, don't basically, you know, don't treat it as though there's something meaningful all the way on the left. So um, this will load it into a data frame, which we see below. And then here I've just done a little bit of additional manipulation, uh, making sure that we're, even though these are numerical values, um, we are really thinking of them as text. You know, this is a, this number is a label. It wouldn't make sense to subtract one invoice number from another. Uh, so I'm just turning those into strings, right? Into text data. Um, so that we'll have a little bit better tools for working with them. So we load that data frame in and we can take a look at the first few rows of it. Now here at the bottom of the cell, I've called df.head, this head method. And by default, this is gonna give us the first five rows of a data frame. It's just a nice way to get a quick look as you're going through your analysis. You know, what does this data frame look like right now? Um, just sort of a, you know, what are the, what kinds of values do we see? What are the columns um, without trying to, you know, without loading in or displaying more than we need to. Now, if we just say df, and I should, probably should not have tried to load that again. Um, if we just say DF, it won't show every single row. Um, rather, it will truncate them or condense them in the middle and it'll show the first five and the last five rows. And it'll also tell us the number of rows and columns that we have. So here we see that there are a little over 42,000 rows, meaning that there are a little bit over 42,000, well, not exactly items sold because there's also, you know, the quantity of items that were sold. Um, but just, you know, in, an idea of, you know, the amount of data we're working with. Each one of these rows is 
in a particular transaction, a particular product that was sold to a particular customer, and how many of those products were sold in that transaction. And of course, you know, where it went to the price and, and the date and so forth. So again, when we just say DF, we see this sort of output kind of truncating in the middle or condensing in the middle. We see the size or the shape of the data frame. And if we just want to see a few rows, we can do df.head. Now, in some cases, you might want to get a preview sort of randomly into the data frame. df.sample, this sample method, um, will let us do just that. And so if we do df.sample and give it an argument of five, then that's just going to pull five random rows. And if we were to keep running this over and over again, we would continue to get five random rows. So this is something, again, that is useful if we're just sort of wandering through our data before we really get into any hardcore analysis. We just want to get a feel for what it contains. Using df.head for the top of the data frame, sample for a couple different rows, um, just lets us do a little bit of that. I will also say a note on Jupyter Notebooks, um, since I forgot to mention this. So you may notice me adding new cells as we go along. Anytime you have a cell selected like this, so on the left, if we click over here, this is blue, we can press A, it'll create a new cell above. We can press B, it will create a new cell below. And you may see me doing this just every once in a while because it's going to, you know, if I need to make any additional examples, I'll be doing something like that. So we have our data. We know how big our data is. We generally know what it contains. And we can see why we might have some issues, you know, with 40,000 rows and, you know, our only real way of analyzing our inventory being these descriptions. We can see why we might start running into trouble trying to perform meaningful analysis on this text in Excel. So let's start working our way towards extracting some meaning from this column, this description column. The first thing we're going to do, um, as we really always should, when we are sort of interrogating a new data set, is to see if we have missing values, check the integrity of the data, right? At least that's part of data integrity. And so we can do that right here. And we can see the, for each one of those columns, the proportion of rows, you know, what percentage of those rows of those line items are missing a value for that column. So it looks like about 0.3% are missing a description. And it looks like about 37%, 36.7% are missing a customer ID. Now, we may or may not have more context for this, for why this might be happening. But we could imagine that perhaps not all customers are, have made usernames, and perhaps we're not tracking customers who um, perhaps don't you know, register accounts with us. Um, and perhaps they don't end up with a customer ID, or perhaps there was just an error in the data. But our main concern right now is going to be getting into this, working with these descriptions. So we don't really have any use for the rows that are missing descriptions. We're just gonna go ahead and drop those. Let's see what those rows look like, those rows that are missing descriptions. So here I'm gonna filter into the data frame. We'll talk about filtering more in a little while. And we're going to say, give me all of those rows where there's no description. And let's look at 10 of those. And so we see it's perhaps not really clear what's happening here. Um, it looks like a lot of those are in happening around um, you know, the 1st of December 2010, um, which could suggest an error in our data around that time, something we, if we were you know, focusing more on data integrity in this demo, we might start trying to account for it a little bit more. Um, but we see that, you know, we have some of this information. We're missing descriptions. We're missing unit prices. Customer IDs we're not really going to be able to recover. Um, but we could imagine finding, you know, for this stock code, this particular item, we know what that description is. We know what that unit price should be. And we could, in fact, if we wanted to, go back in and, you know, start trying to fill in these missing terms um, you know, in a context-specific way. 
But for now, we're just going to drop these um, because we're looking for general trends. And there are relatively few rows of this nature. There's only about 0.3% of them. So if our interest is in finding you know, basic trends in our data, we can ignore this for now. So we'll go ahead and just remake our data frame to just be all of those rows that um, actually have descriptions. This way, since we're you know, really looking and work into working with that description, that text data, um, we don't have any rows that are going to be you know, useless to us. OK. So one thing that we could do to start, and perhaps this is a little bit before we work with the text data, we just might ask a question like, what products were selling well this month? Um, to do this, of course, since our data frame, again, making a new cell by clicking here and pressing A for a new cell above, df.head to view the first five rows of our data frame. We want to know what's selling well. Well, then we would need to, you know, we could think of these stock codes, right? These are the items themselves. We would maybe want to group over these stock codes. And then from there, you know, see if we can add up all the quantities that sold across all these different it, transactions, right? That appear in these different invoices. And so we would be doing some aggregation. And so we're going to look at some aggregation. I would also like to point out, though, that the last few rows here, um, and we see this as well once we start aggregating, so we, we can see in the, the, just in the data frame itself that here we have two stock codes with the same number and a different letter. And in fact, when we look at the interesting, um, we look at the description, well, it's maybe not clear if these are the same thing, um, but we should be clued into, you know, is it meaningful that they have the same stock code and a different description, um, something that we're going to want to pay attention to. So we see another example here where the stock code for both of these is 10, 1, 2, 4, and A and G are giving us these different colors, essentially. And generally, this is what we're seeing throughout the data set, um, which is that for a stock code to differ only in a letter, it means as a variation it is a color of a particular product. Now, if we just grouped on these stock codes and tried to figure out what was selling well, well, now we've just disadvantaged things that come in different colors, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new feature, a new column, which is going to have a stock code base and a stock code color. And we've done this just by splitting that string, that stock code right here, and saying, OK, if there's a letter, let's put that into another column. And if there's no letter, we'll just do a negative one as a placeholder. And so with these two columns, now we can a little bit more descriptively make a data frame of our products themselves. And here we can also see, for this particular product, there's only one color that it comes in. And we could, in fact, we look at you know a few different random rows here. We can see that you know for some of these products, um, these do appear in different colors. So here we have just the stock code base, um, but you know one of those colors that we ended up grabbing was the jet black particular you know variation. Um, and so here we now have like a table of our products. This is something we might want in an Excel spreadsheet later to just summarize what we sold. Um, so we'll hold on to this for later. But we're going towards our top selling items. And so using the pieces I've made before, I'm grouping by that stock code base. And again, we have to move through some of the code a little bit quickly here. But we're grouping on the stock code base, ignoring the colors for now. And we're going to start essentially adding together you know, the total quantity of items sold across all transactions this month. That quantity, of course, we can multiply by the unit price. That will give us the you know, gross revenue for that product for that month. And what we've written here is just a little function that we can put in a data frame, and we can get the, you know, in order, the top 10 selling items, how much it costs, how many of them sold, and the gross revenue for, those, for that particular item for that time period. 
And so again, you know, now we're getting this other sort of intermediate table. So we'll set this aside for now and we'll see, you know, how we can start bringing these together at the end. The things we've done so far are pretty basic in many ways, um, things that would be not too difficult to do in Excel. We've mostly just aggregated over categories and values. Um, but let's start doing something more interesting. Let's work with these descriptions, you know, as, as promised. So again, looking at the head of our data frame, these descriptions, you know, they are our text. They describe what the item actually is. And we see, okay, well, you know, maybe let's investigate this one right here. We have the Union flag, right? The Union Jack, the, you know, the flag of the UK. Um, this is a UK-based company. Not surprising, we're selling, you know, some products like this. Let's take a look at, you know, what if we just wanted to see data that, where this description mentioned, you know, Union, the Union flag, right? So what we can do is we can filter our data frame so that it only has rows where the description contains that string, union. And we'll just look at a few different rows here. Sure enough, union jack, union flag, union flag, union flag. And we see that a lot of these are, perhaps unsurprisingly, shipping to the UK. Out of curiosity, maybe we take a look at, okay, well, for all of these rows, let's just look at the country they sold to and let's look at, you know, where they ended up being shipped or shipped. And it turns out that pretty much all of those products were shipped to the UK. Now, a little bit of a trivial example here, but again, this is it, you know, the basics of how we can start accessing string data with pandas. But that's still just one string. And I'm not convinced that it would be that all that difficult to do something like that in Excel. Here's where we really start getting some more powerful tools. Pandas um, works natively with what are called regular expressions. Now, this is very outside of the scope of today's demo, um, but regular expressions give us, in many ways, a, we can think of this as a recipe for you know, finding or matching text, extracting certain parts of text or strings that look kind of like certain patterns. So locating patterns, um, checking for the presence of patterns, extracting patterns you know, from strings, from text. And so what we've done here is I've built a little regular expression. Don't really have time to do syntax, but what this says is look for any of these colors in a description. Is it black, white, red, green, blue, or pink? And if you find one of those, let's capture whatever you find in there and we're gonna return that. And we're actually gonna use this. We'll take a look now after running this cell. We'll take a look now and we now have a new column called description color. And this is the color that gets mentioned in the description when there is one. And so now, given those colors, we could also say what, you know, what colors appear in the descriptions and how do those inform our sales? It turns out for this particular month, ignoring you know, products that were not labeled according to this labeling system, um, red was drastically outperforming all of the colors and green was really, really falling behind. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list of colors. Um, we could make use of more powerful tools, even things like natural language processing to identify colors, even to match different types of, let's say, shades of red together um, with something more sophisticated. But the basics here, we're using this regular expression to pull out information that we know is there in a lot of these rows but that we need to be a little bit general about what that pattern looks like. And so that is, sorry, that is, you know, getting that feature with a regular expression and using that to create a new table, what colors we're selling well. Now, another thing we can do, uh, and perhaps less pertinent to this exact particular example, um, we have these dates of our transactions. Once again, I'll pull up the head of the data frame. We can see, okay, this one was sold on December 1st, um, you know, at this time of day. And, you know, while this appears to us as text, we actually can work with this as like a date and time object. We can query things from it, like what year was this? What was the day of the week? What's the hour, the minute? Um, and we can use that to inform our analysis. Now, kind of a 
funny example here, um, but we mentioned that we mostly are dealing with wholesalers, you know, business customers. We might think, are they making their purchases on weekdays? Are they making their purchases between nine and five? And we can take a look at that. So here I've just counted out, you know, what are the common days of the week? And here zero is Monday, four is Friday. Um, and so we actually find that we don't have invoices on Saturdays, perhaps how our invoicing system works. Um, we're closed somehow on Saturdays as a website. Um, but we can see, you know, that's extracting the day of the week from that column. We can also look at the hour of day. And in fact, we can very quickly generate a histogram from the hour of day. We see that a lot of people, at least relevant or, you know, um, um, you know, relative to UK time are making these purchases right around noon um, or it looks like right around 3 to 4 p.m. Now using that logic we could even filter out data and say let's only look at transactions maybe that appeared during business hours 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. Maybe not super relevant for our particular analysis right now but just to demonstrate the power of pandas here. We make this filter that says everything from nine to five. So here we have the hour is gonna be greater than or equal to nine, but it is also gonna be less than 17, right? That's five o'clock PM on that 24 hour clock. So this gives us every row that would satisfy that. Then we say, let's just get the weekdays. We wanna know that we want the day of week to be zero through four, that's Monday through Friday. And in fact, we can use these after building these filters we can just grab data that, you know, was generated during those times. Again, not that relevant to our particular needs, but just to show the power and flexibility of working with dates in Pandas. We can start putting this together. Um, now we have, you know, our original data. We have these intermediate data frames that we've built, you know, looking at our products kind of as a catalog. We have what products we're selling well, you know, the top 10 products, we have the top, we have the, you know, what colors we're selling the best in terms of gross revenue. Um, we can now write those out into an Excel file. And in fact, using this library XLXS writer, um, we can actually write pretty sophisticated Excel files. We won't get it in, into it today, but we can actually even generate charts um, using this package. But for now, we'll just be using this to put a couple different pages or sheets into a spreadsheet. So we're going to basically just for this particular, um, for that particular data frame, I'll run this cell and we're just gonna make a new Excel file called December 2010 XLSX um, that has the original data, that has the product catalog, that has the top selling items for that month and the top selling colors all in different sheets. And I'll show you what that looks like. And while I do that, I'm also going to start running a little bit of code. I'm just going to do this on a few different months here. Um, to show you how we can actually now automate this process, now that I've loaded in um, you know, all of the file paths for every single month, I packaged up everything we just did into a basically into a little function. And just calling that function, load and process data frame, and then generate report, we can actually just directly from these strings, make those data frames and write to Excel. This will be running and then another thing will be running for a moment, but I'm gonna go ahead and switch my screen share to show you what our new Excel spreadsheet looks like that we just wrote out of our that we just wrote out from um, this notebook. So let's see, let's we'll stop share to switch tabs, switch apps. And let's go. Sure enough. And we see that in some cases, if we haven't been given too much attention to column width, um, we sometimes do need to modify this with XLSX writer. Um, but we now have this, you know, sort of original data frame 
We have a sheet for our products. We have a sheet for the top items that sold. And we have a sheet for how the colors sold. And again, this is a very basic example using this library to produce Excel files. Um, we actually can do a lot more sophisticated things as well. And we'll be starting questions in just a moment. We'll have a few minutes for that. But um, the last thing I will show you is that in addition to generating these reports for each month separately, we can also take all of those monthly data frames and we can stack them together into one big data frame, one big table for all of our data. And basically for us, that looks like an entire year's worth of transactions. With that, and really with just a single line of code that did that, we can then, you know, get the top selling items over a whole bunch of, you know, different months. And here we're only looking at four months, but we could do it for any number of monthly reports. And we could say that, okay, well, overall, you know, this three tier cake stand was still selling the best. And we can even just with the same function we used before, generate a spreadsheet just like we saw a moment ago for all of the data. And so here we're sort of, you know, speeding up our workflow, automating tasks in two different ways. We are automatically applying the same transformations, manipulations, and analyses across multiple Excel files. We're also automating the process of bringing a lot of files together. Um, so we don't have to do anything like opening a bunch of these ourselves and copying and pasting and making sure that we get everything lined up correctly, um, you know, just opening and closing out perhaps, you know, tens, dozens of, of different files. Um, we can loop through all of those automatically with Python and Pandas, turn it into one big data frame, and then make a report from that just as easily. And I'll take questions in just a minute. Um, but the last thing I'll show as a bonus, because many people, when they see Pandas, they say, this is great. It looks very powerful. I can kind of examine my data, but um, what if I want to get a little bit closer to that, you know, look and feel of Excel? What if I want to be able to, for instance, click into this and, you know, change this particular, change this particular field? You know, what if I want to fix this spelling of chili lights, for instance? Um, how do we get back to that? How can we, you know, get something like a point and click solution in Python with pandas with Jupyter Notebooks? And so just a quick demo of QGrid, um, which is a super cool open source library. This links to their GitHub, um, which lets you open up a pandas data frame in this interactive way. And so here we can even, you know, kind of have a pop-up window and we can scroll through all of this and we can say, okay, well maybe for no particular reason, we can change this description to the old computer science example of hello world. We can close that out. That shows the description. Now, if we want to make sure this writes back to our original data frame, we need to run this qgrid get changed data frame method. So just say data frame equals get changed data frame. And now we see just from doing that kind of point and click interaction, this has been changed just like we did above to hello world. So even with the, you know, we get these incredibly powerful techniques and tools we can apply with pandas. We lose a little bit in terms of interactivity, pointing and clicking, you know, filling in stuff sort of manually. Um, but we can make up a fair amount of that, um, augmenting our workflow with QGrid if you really, really can't, you know, let go of too much of that sort of point and click interface. I'll also mention that in QGrid, we can even do things like filtering. We can do things like sorting as well, um, but th these are gonna be more limited in scope than pandas. All right, um, it's 12.45 Eastern. That concludes the, you know, the main content for today um, and probably have about five minutes or so for, um, for questions. Yeah, so I see a couple of questions you guys posted on the chat. So let me direct them towards Michael. Uh, someone is asking, what are your recommended resources for learning how to use XLS Writer for both basic and more sophisticated tasks 
such as formatting and chart creating? That is a great question. The main resource I always look to um, when using these open source libraries, um, and you know, I, I usually hope that they are well documented. I'm happy to say that XLSX actually is very well documented, has a lot of examples, and is actually very descriptive. And so I believe I linked to that right down here. So XLSX Writer, and I'll paste the link in the chat as well. So this is the official documentation um, for the package. They have a lot of really powerful uh, examples doing a lot of really, really cool stuff. Um, this is the main thing that I would start from because they really cover all of the functionality and they do so from the ground up. Um, and again, you know, my example is very basic. We weren't really building charts. We weren't really formatting things a whole lot. Um, just really generating those spreadsheets in kind of a default way, but we can modify column sizes. We can merge cells. Um, we can even create pivot tables. We can, you know, format cells with color and so forth. Um, there really are a number of opportunities. Um, I'll also really quickly mention, so for materials being available after the tutorial ends, um, as Kelly said, the video will be available on YouTube soon. Um, and in addition, this binder uh, link will continue to be up. Um, anytime you navigate to this link, um, mybinder.org will spin up a little container for you to run this repository. Um, and you'll be able to run it right from your browser. You also, um, if you were to, I'll just grab the link right here. When you follow that link, you'll get this, um, you'll see that it links to this, or that we have this field for the GitHub repo I wrote this in, which I just did, um, I'll show right here. And so here is the GitHub repo itself, and you can clone this onto your own machine as well. Um, and if you have you know, a Python installation, I would recommend Anaconda, um, you can, basically set up to run this yourself on your own machine instead of just on binder. So I see one other question, um, which is, is it possible to protect spreadsheets with XLS X writer set as read only? I do not believe that XLS X writer has that degree of sophisticated or that degree of functionality. Um, I have not seen it done before, but while we're here, while we have our, you know, most trustworthy reference, we can certainly search the docs, something like read only. And not really clear here. Um, I don't believe it does. That may be something you have to incorporate into a different workflow. Um, I think it mostly exposes the API for actually modifying the tables themselves um, more so than really setting like file permissioning and things like that. All right, guys, we're running out of time. So that's the last question we'll take. Thank you for showing up. Thank you uh, for going through and asking your questions. Thank you, Micah, for taking time for demonstrating the tools, the things you can do uh, with Python and Panda. So with that said, we're going to wrap up uh, today's event. Take care, guys. Thanks, everyone. Take care.